for this academic year. I'm Rachel Breckis, and this is my colleague, Kimberly Muller. And we're here to hopefully give you some information you can use for everything that you undertake this semester and beyond at the library. So this session is both in person and online. And I know I personally always have a little bit of a weird, uncentered feeling when I do that, trying to watch chat a little bit so we have a designated other person than those of us speaking who will be watching and responding to chat. But occasionally, I'll ask people to raise their hands. And I urge those of you who are in the chat online to, to raise your virtual hands. There should be some little hand raisey icon thing you can hit to, to raise hands for things. So, um, so now that we've mentioned our names, we oh, and what we what we do at the libraries is we work in instruction, we work in collection development, which means you know buying the things <laughs> for the library, the the books, the journals, the electronic resources, and stuff like that. And then we also work at the reference desk or the information desk, as you may know it, kind of the place that's downstairs when you walk in and kind of in front of the big computer lab area there. And we can answer questions related to research and staplers and printers, but preferably research. But <laughs> and we're happy. And we all have subject areas that we broadly cover. And but there's a lot of general things that we all do. So that's kind of what we do. And I'd like to, to get a sense of what all different subjects you all specialize in. First of all, a little bit of hand raising. I'd like you to raise your hand if you are a first year graduate student. Okay, good. A um, undergraduate. Okay, uh, faculty. Okay, and of course I wasn't watching the hands online. Yeah, there was one up for a first year graduate student. Is anyone you. here who's not a first year graduate student? You are a graduate student, but you it might not be your first semester. Okay, return to graduate student. Awesome. Okay, great. And it looks like that's where our online. Oh. Are as well. All right. Thank you for joining us. Yes, good. That gives some impression. And and now for some specifics, all the online people can go ahead and just type into the chat box the answer to this, and the rest of you all kind of go around real briefly. I don't need your names because me, I'm I'm bad at names anyway. So I'm going to be honest. I'm not going to remember your name. But what I want to know is your department because that's going to steer a little bit, maybe some of the examples that we might use for things. So. Political science. So political science, great. Uh-huh. Nursing. Great. Uh-huh. Uh, education leadership on policy and policy. Yeah, a couple ed, a couple of nursing, both good. information science and learning technologies. Excellent. I'm also with Alpha. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. uh, okay. Acronym watch. Oh. <laughs> What? Journalism. 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 Okay, very good. And I'm a journalist. Okay. All right, great. Great. Well, welcome. great. So the people online, we have education, business, civil, which I'm assuming is civil engineering, um, and food science. And I don't know if those of you online could hear, but we have a lot of people from education, from journalism, from nursing, um, from library science, and kind of around the board. So great. Thank you. So what ground we're going to cover today is going to be the role of the subject liaisons, people like us, and in the library. And then also some information about basic library services that affect pretty much everyone especially those things for you returning people that may have changed slightly or majorly recently that you'll want to be um, up on. A little bit about the phenomenon of citation tools, such as EndNote and Zotero and Mendeley, that can help you kind of streamline your research process, that it's a good idea to think about throughout your research process. Talk a little bit about MoSpace, which is our MU digital repository, that is, a kind of the, the aspect of the library and aspect of the library a lot of people don't think about, a way to sort of store the scholarly production of this university, particularly in dissertations, but other things too. Um, what you can get from the relationships that this library has with other important libraries and research centers by interlibrary loan and 
and special partners and that. And and then a little bit, let's see, how many of you have teaching responsibilities where you teach undergraduates? Just, okay, not have any online. Okay, not too many, so we won't probably talk too much about it, but we have an undergraduate um, research contest as well. And, and then finally, just how to find out more information. There's lots of ways to just sort of remain in communication with the library, and we'll go over a little bit of that as well. So subject librarians, do any of you know who your subject librarian is? You all have one. Good, you got one or two who do. I'm overjoyed. That's great. Now, the first thing that I'll show you on our website, which is very easy to remember, it's just library.missouri.edu. Um, if you go to directories, directories are, you know, common way to look people up. You can go up there and right there, the third tab, you see subject librarians. So if you are in, let's see, one of the ones that was mentioned here, and well, you can see all of the subjects really got some of our educational subjects. Um, the educational counseling psychology is Kimberly right there. And whereas most of the rest of education is our colleague, Dr. Paula Roper, who is one of the couple of librarians we have who actually has a doctorate. And she, She's not here, but you can see that each librarian's got a few subjects that we're in charge of. And being in charge of a subject basically means, like I say, we buy the stuff, we teach specialized classes in it, and we can create specialized web pages and subject guides for those subjects, which is often good for people teaching. But you know, if you just want a, a subject guide on some subject, you don't have to do it in conjunction with the class. You can contact us and say, hey, you know, I'd, I'd like to have a subject guide in some overall topic that people do. So those are those are things that we do and just know that you have one and that there's a you know often people who are kind of getting into a new field or if you're in one field and you're having to do some work <laughs> in another field and you're not really familiar with that other field's literature, the subject librarian in that other field is an excellent person to talk to about that. And then also if you want us to, you know, to buy some book or some resource that that would support you in your research, these are the people you contact about that. Okay, so that's the subject librarian and now we will turn to a few basics of how to look up stuff from Kimberly. Okay, so switching gears a little bit. Um, again, we talk about resources in the library a lot. I just want to mention one more time, like Rachel said, the people that work in the library are one of the greatest greatest resources that we have to offer. We have books, we have databases, we have articles, but if you don't know where to look to find those pieces of information, please do feel free to ask. That's one of the reasons that we're here. So always feel free, like this first link says, to contact us. Um, I'm going to get into a little bit of the basics on how to actually find materials. We do have another session later on doing more in-depth literature reviews, so I'm not going to go too far into that. I'm just going to run a few searches to show you how our different tools work, where you might be interested in looking to find that research material you need. Um, if you've been at the university for more than a semester, you'll notice that our web page has changed a little bit. We used to have multiple yellow tabs here, um, and over the summer, we did get a new discovery tool. A discovery tool, if you're not familiar with the term, is something that runs a lot like Google. It uses natural language for searching, so you don't have to create a complex search. You can just type in your search as it is, as you think of it. Um, so, for example, if I wanted to know information on chocolate and health, you can see I've run this search before, I would just type it in and say chocolate and health and run the search. Um, before I run this, I do want to point out this doesn't include everything that the library has. It's a very good place to start. It does have a lot of interdisciplinary material, so you're going to find a little bit of everything, but it's not subject specific. You won't find all that really detailed information. It's just going to be um, an overview but it is a really good place to start. So we're gonna run a search, and you can see what that looks like. And I know for the people online, it does take a second or two to catch up, so I am gonna pause every time I change screens and hope that that keeps it from being an issue. Um, when you first run the search, you'll see there are a ridiculous number of results. None of us are going to go through two million results on this topic, so there are a lot of ways to limit. The side column on the left is a way to, as it says, refine your results, to limit it to what actually might be the most useful. 
there are a couple that I want to point out. The first one is academic and peer-reviewed journals. This is important, not because the only information you should use is peer-reviewed, but in many of your classes, it's a requirement for papers that you write and for research that you do. And this makes that requirement much easier to fulfill. You just check that box and everything that isn't peer reviewed disappears. Um, one of our new specifications that we have as an option is limiting to MU collections. Um, right now, the search runs through everything that you might be able to find in the MU system. It's going to include UMSL, it's going to include um, UMKC, Rollis campus, they're materials that you can easily get. So we want you to be able to see that they exist and that you can get them. But we don't have necessarily all of them <laughs> on campus. Um, a lot of them we do, a large portion of them I would say we do, but not everything. If you're writing a paper the night before it's due, checking that MU collection will mean that you'll find it that night. I know. I like to say don't write your paper the night before it's due, but that would be hypocritical because I've done that before in my life. Um, there's also a limitation by publication date. Again, this is different based on the department you're in. History might not necessarily want recent information. Science will. Um, so you can move that bar over and say, okay, well, I'm only interested in things that have been published within the last, say, five years. It's hard to make the toolbar be exact. We'll start at 1985 and then work our way forward. There were a lot of years applied there. So I'm, for those of you that are online, it's going to go kind of quick, but I'm just moving that toolbar over, not toolbar, sliding bar over, so that it's a five-year period of time. And you'll see already that I've gone from 2 million results to about 320,000. That's still way too many, but I've only limited to one thing. You can go through that list, find other ways to limit. Once you've gotten the number of results you kind of want to work with and the results you're looking at actually seem relevant, then you would look into actually accessing them and opening them. Um, each result is going to have a little icon that tells you what that result is, whether it's a book, whether it's an academic journal article, whether it's a newspaper article, whether it's a DVD. We have all sorts of things in the collection. And this search does run through a large chunk of them. Um, so you can see what the material is. And if one looks good, you can click on the title. And it will give you more information. You'll have a paragraph for a book, it's usually called a summary. For an article, it's called an abstract that tells you a bit more about what this particular material is talking about. Um, and there are a number of other tools that are pretty useful. There's um, ways to cite if you're interested in citation formats. You can see a variety of different citation formats, APA, MLA. It's in alphabetical order. Um, you can export if you've already started using EndNote, Zotero, or Mendeley. Um, Rachel's going to talk a little bit more about that later. But you can export to one of those options. Um, and just this toolbar can be really useful. Um, over on the left-hand side is how you would actually access the material. If it's an article online, there's going to be a PDF full text link. Um, sometimes, though, instead of that PDF full text link, you'll get other information. For example, this one. Um, instead of that PDF full text link, there's a find it at MU link. Um, just really quickly, does anyone know what the find it at MU button means? What goes on the hard copy? It could sometimes mean that there's a hard copy. Does this mean that it's going to take you to That's almost exactly what it means. It means that the search that we ran doesn't have it in this particular search. It's not existing in the discover search, but we might have it in another location. So if you click this, it's going to link you to that other location. And if we don't have it, it's going to send you to a link where you can request it for another library. So even if you see that find it at MU, please click on it. In this particular case, it says the item isn't available. But I do want to point that out because right below that, it says request a copy. Um, and this is usually a pretty quick request, especially if it's an article. A lot of you know, I got mine same day yesterday. Mm -hmm. I mean, so like two hours later, the thing was there. Exactly. Articles are electronic. So usually when we send a request to another library, if it's electronic, it's a very fast process. Um, for those of you that are graduate students, if you're requesting a dissertation or thesis, sometimes that can take a little bit longer depending on that university. But it's usually a very quick process. So if you see that Find It at MU button, don't feel like you can't use it. Um, sometimes I'm going to try one more just to see if it'll redirect, and this time it does. 
So it could mean we have it, it's just in a different location, or it could mean that we don't have it. In this case, I'm not sure what happened. That wasn't a good example. <laughs> um, but anyway, it should redirect you to a place where you can still get the article, regardless of whether it's in our collection or in another library's collection. Okay, so I'm going to head back to the homepage, the library homepage. That gray box, again, like I mentioned earlier, is just one way to start searching. It's not the only way to search. Um, we're not going to get too much into that now because we are going to do sessions later on running literature review searches and on doing bigger searches, but it's a way to get started. Does anyone know where else you would go to look for either articles or books? Okay. Databases? Databases, absolutely. Um, what's in databases? What do you find in databases? Yes, that's exactly it. Um, databases have journals and journal articles in them. Um, and that's putting it simply, but a database to find articles and journals. I mentioned before the gray box we looked at was just a very broad overview. It's very interdisciplinary. If you want more specific material, you want to go into a database, specifically one that relates to a certain subject. If you know the name of a database, you can type the name in. We have several hundred databases at the University of Missouri. I don't have any idea what all of their names are. No librarian does. We don't expect you to. So we do have them categorized in a variety of other ways. Database by type is if you're looking for a specific type of information. If you want newspapers, if you want images because you're taking an art class, if you want um, plays or monologues, um, if you want specific types of material, you can search for it that way. But by and far, the most useful, in my opinion, is the databases by subject link. So you can pick a subject that you work with. Um, I'm going to scroll down just so you can see how many different options there are. There's education, um, there's psychology. Things can not necessarily just fall in one of these categories. For example, if you're doing education and counseling psychology, you might go into either one of those subjects that I pointed out. I'm going to pick the one at the end of the list, Women and Gender Studies, just for fun. And it's going to take you to a page that lists the top databases that you would use to find articles in that particular subject area. So this page has ones that are very specific to Women and Gender Studies, and also ones that are multidisciplinary and would also relate to that topic. So for example, Gender Watch. Gender Watch is the premier Women and Gender Studies database that exists. Um, also, please feel free to stop me at any point if you have questions on how I'm getting to something and where I'm clicking. I know that our website has a lot of links, and we click around a fair amount. So if you have a question as to how we got somewhere, please ask. Anyway, subject databases. The neat thing about this is it doesn't just tell you about databases. You'll notice that it pulled you into a guide that has all sorts of yellow tabs in it. Um, this is a guide for women and gender studies materials overall. It's going to have a lot of information in it not just on articles. You can find books, you can find background information. Statistics is particularly relevant in many fields, um, especially in education. So if you're looking for, I shouldn't say especially, it's relevant in a lot of fields, um, but if you're looking for any information on a topic, it doesn't matter what format, a guide is a really good place to go. Um, we have guides for finding primary sources, if that's a requirement for your class. There are guides for almost every subject you can imagine. Um, so it's a really good tool to know about. Yes? I have a question about the primary sources. Does that appear in every um, database Okay, so the question was just for the people online, if you didn't hear it, um, what's the kind of the best way to find primary sources? Is it going to show up in every database? And the answer is no. Not every database has primary sources. Um, and it kind of depends, again, on the field you're talking about. For history, a primary source is, of course, something that was created during the time you're studying. So journals, pieces of art, letters, um, newspapers from that time period. And there are databases that specifically focus on primary resources. And there are um, subject yes. for historical Rachel, our history librarian, has created 
a subject guide that's specifically about primary resources. And I'm going to go back to the home page really quickly. Like I mentioned before, we click around a lot. If you ever don't know where something is located, so say you're looking for primary sources, there's a search bar at the very top of the page. And this works the same way any search bar on a website works. Um, if you don't know where to find something on a page or on a site that has many, many, many subpages, go to the search bar and type it in. So for this example, we would say primary sources. And you'd run the search. And it's going to bring you to the guide. Um, there's one that's government documents as primary sources. So those are things that governments have created. And then there's one that's history, primary sources. And the other thing is uh, primary sources, if you're talking about a science, often what they mean by primary sources are like experimental articles. Like they're, they are journal articles, things that history would consider a secondary source. Mm -hmm. But in science, that's a primary, I mean, that experiment gets written up yeah, and its true. primary thing is going to be, and there it depends very often you get specialized databases that allow you to limit in that way, but it really depends on the database. And it depends on the subject area. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, just like there's there's databases for religious studies that let you limit by a book of the Bible, like what book of the Bible, I mean, and, and unfortunately they only do the Christian Bible in this particular database, but, but they let you limit that way. There's history databases that let you limit by what year something was written about. So every database, especially the subject specialized databases, have got relevant limits. And you should always, always, no matter what database you're in, look at what limits are available to your search and see if, if they fit kind of the requirements. That's, that's a librarian's tip for free. <laughs> but. OK, so that's articles going in through databases. We kind of got libguides in there at the same time. I want to talk about books, too. Um, books are typically found in a catalog. And our catalog is called Merlin. The acronym is not really important to remember, but it is that last link on the left, the classic catalog. This is the best place to go to search for books. Um, there are a couple ways that you can go about doing it. If you don't know what the title of a book is, you can search just by keyword in general. If you do know the title, say you're looking for The Very Hungry Caterpillar, a children's book, um, you could search for it by title. But again, if you don't know, you can use keywords. And like most of our pages, it does have yellow tabs across the top. If you have multiple things you want to search for at the same time, you can go into the advanced search and change it up. And all of our databases, our catalog, everything always has an advanced search. So if you just see one bar, there are more bars hiding somewhere. And if you want to make your search more complicated um, and have more aspects to it, always look for where the advanced option is. Um, again, we'll talk about that when we're doing literature reviews. But for now, I'm going to do chocolate and health again. Health. You'll see it's already got my and in there for me. Um, the thing I want to point out about the catalog is that in a database, you can run your search, and then you get all those limiters. You can check those boxes off later. In a catalog, you have to do that before you run the search. It's flipped. Um, so if you wanted to limit by a certain date, you would do that before you ran the search. If you wanted to limit to a certain format, you could do so. Um, I know some people prefer books over ebooks or vice versa. Um, if you're off campus, for those of you online, if you're distance learning students and you'd really prefer to only find ebooks, you could do it that way. Um, for those of you that are here as well, we have movies and DVDs. So if you get bored over the weekend and you want to watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer, you can look for that as well. So I'm going to keep my search simple. I'm just searching for chocolate and health, and I will hit submit. So the catalog does run relatively similarly to a database. There are a couple differences. Um, first, though, the picture icon you get on the side is similar. You can see there's a little bit of difference here. This one's a book. This one's an ebook. It lets you know a little bit about what the material is. Um, relevancy. The relevancy. So my chocolate and health search did not work very well because neither of these seems to be relevant at all. I'm going to switch that to a title search. I want the title to have the words chocolate and health in it. And it's now, of course, that it wants that to be the exact title. OK, let's just run it together. Chocolate and health. Let's not get fancy. OK, there we go. Now we're getting things that are relevant, chocolate and health. That other search was weird. OK, again, still, you're getting books, you're getting ebooks, And you'll notice in the middle that there's information about where that material can be found. 
Um, if it's an ebook, it's found online. It's pretty easy to access. Um, you would just click on the title and there'll be a link that says, you know, access it online. If it's a physical material, though, there's three things you want to look at. One is the status. Is it checked out or not? If it's not checked out, it should be available and you can get it. If it is checked out, it's not there and going to the library to look for it would waste your time. It also has a location. We have, does anyone want to guess how many libraries we have on this campus? Hearing some murmuring. Go ahead, chat out a number. There's no wrong answer. Five? Around 10. 10? 10? 5, 10? I'm sorry, it's not. Yeah, it depends. It's somewhere seven, eight, <laughs> somewhere in that range. Sometimes people count our newspaper archives. Sometimes they count the university archives. It's somewhere between the number of seven and nine. Um, but it is important to know where you're going. Yes? Yeah, so on the same page, some articles say below status, um, library use only. What is it? Yes. Um, library, so let's see, I'll scroll down a little bit and see if I can find, okay, here's one where the status is library use only. Um, you'll notice that the location is in special collections. Our library, and this is actually in Ellis, so it's MU Ellis, so it's in this building, um, has some very rare materials. And if it's very rare, there are some things where there's only one copy in the world, and we have that copy, but we don't check it out because we don't want it to never come back. <laughs> um, and we want it to be available for multiple people to use. So if you have a whole class that needs the same material at the same time, um, it stays in the library so everyone can come and go as they please, but it's available to everyone at the same time. So there's multiple reasons. Library use only means it's physically in the building, but it just can't be checked out and taken home. Was yes, say. so this one isn't a rare one necessarily. It's a microfilm, um, which is a little tiny card that there's there's different types of microform, microfilm, microfiche. It gets technical, but you need a reader, a machine to actually be able to see it because the print is very, very tiny. Um, it's a way of storing newspapers frequently so that you get a lot of newspapers on one little tiny card and it doesn't take up as much space to store and also doesn't disintegrate as quickly. Um, but you need a machine to be able to read it because it's very, very, very tiny. So there's different reasons, but the status just means that it's physically in the library. You would have to come to the library to use it. Okay. Um, if you go into a particular book, again, it gives you that location. So this one's in the Health Sciences Library, which for those of you that are in a nursing program, you may wind up over there a fair amount more than over here. Um, and it gives you a call number, which tells you where in the building it's located. At Ellis Library, we have little yellow sheets of paper. They're floating around everywhere. Um, some of you have them in front of you at the desk. Um, and it tells you, based on the letters, and this isn't a good example because this one isn't in Ellis, but based on the letters, where in the building you would go to. You can also click on the call number, and it'll tell you where in the building to go to. Or if you click on the location, it'll tell you what the matchup is. But it just lets you know where to go. These little yellow pieces of paper can be found pretty much everywhere, at the circulation desk, at the reference desk, um, at the security desks, all over the place. Signs in the elevators have the same information. Mm -hmm. The last thing I want to point out before I pass this back over to Rachel is if this book was checked out, if we didn't have access to it, or if there was a really specific book you knew you wanted, say you search for the cat in the hat and we didn't have it here, um, the next step is there's always a button that says search Mobius. Uh, Mobius is just the partnership of different libraries in the state of Missouri. So if we don't have a book, you can click search Mobius and it'll say, okay, well, Mizzou doesn't have this book, but a bunch of other libraries do. And as students here, you can request that that book be sent here for you to pick up. If you're a distance learning student, you can request that books be sent to you. And I'll point out a distance learning guide before the end. But um, if we don't have a material, it's the same idea as articles that we talked about. We'll still get it for you. The only difference is physical books do take a little bit longer to snail mail than electronic things take to email. Um, but if we don't have something, we'll definitely get it for you. Okay. So that's a real quick rundown of a lot of different ways to find articles, books, etc. I'm going to pass it back over to Rachel. She's going to talk about what to do with those resources once you find them for a paper. Okay. Now, if you look at the home page down in this lower right, there's a, a little pink gear icon that says apps and tools. And what I'm going to describe real briefly are some apps and tools that we will have sessions, other Fridays at the library sessions about. 
um, coming up throughout the semester. Um, I happen to teach the one on Zotero. Zotero is my personal favorite. Although Mendeley is getting kind of cooler every year, that's, that's a pretty good one too. Then there's EndNote, which is a lot of people in sciences really like EndNote, but they all do, all three of these tools here create, do the same thing. They create what I like to call the magic filing cabinet where you put all of the things that you're ever gonna write a site in your papers even. I mean, you can put everything for one paper into these things and then you can also leave it there for maybe you're going to cite it again in some other paper that you write or in your dissertation or maybe you're going to turn your dissertation in or a chapter from your dissertation into a published article and you want to have you want to have these things in this space so that the thing that it will do is well it can help you organize them and Mendeley especially is really good at helping you like annotate and and keep your comments you know together with the sources themselves like but all three of them will produce for you nicely formatted bibliographies. So you can write an article and the journal you send it to might want it in one format, their particular journal format. You send it that way and they say, you know what, I don't really like this paper. <laughs> and you say, oh, well, there's lots of other journals I can send it to. You send it to some other journal. They want it in some other format and with the hit of a button, any of these things will let you switch from the original format it was in to another format. And especially if the formats are really different from one another, like in history, they use the Chicago format a lot that has actual footnotes. You don't have to touch the footnote function in Word at all. If you use these things, it will make the footnote, it will do everything. It'll do the in-text citation and it will do the footnote. And in the case of APA, which some of your social science people will be using a lot of, it will do the in-text and it'll do the, the works cited list. And it, it does also, you don't have to spend as much, it's, it doesn't, it's not perfect. You have to kind of check over and make sure certain things get done right, but it can save you a lot of time. And we have whole sessions later on in the semester devoted to kind of learning to use them. And we really encourage you at the beginning of your graduate career and at any point in your graduate career, really at any point at all to, I mean, everyone who learns these pretty much says to me, boy, I wish I knew about this, you know, whenever I started. So the earlier you know it, the, the better and, and they're really to be recommended. So you can, each of these guides or each of these tools has a guide associated with it. There's the, my Zotero guide here has got little videos even that I've created and it's telling you how to do individual things with it. But we also have, like I say, the in-person workshops. I have to get the date of the next one up there, but anyway. Um, yeah, so very good tools to be recommended. And now I'll switch back to Kim to talk about the MoSpace digital library. Okay, first of all, who has ever heard of MoSpace? Show of hands. Okay. One person, and it's a library science person. Um, so that's all right. Um, most space is what you would want to consider once you've already written a dissertation, written a paper. If you ever presented a conference, if you do a poster presentation or a session, um, most space is the library's digital repository. It's things that are created by the university. Um, it actually has two different aspects. So I'm going to go under libraries to the MU digital collections. So it's all digital. Most space is entirely digital. And there's two aspects. The first one is what I was talking about, the institutional repository. These are things that are created by people at the University of Missouri, whether it's faculty, whether it's graduate students, whether it's undergraduate research projects. It's academic information that Mizzou staff, students, faculty have created. Um, it's really useful for a number of things. One, it's searchable by Google. If you are a graduate student um, and you want your poster to be findable online, this is the way to do it. It would be scanned in. Um, other people from other universities will be able to see it. When you're going to interview, you can list it as a citation and say, hey, look what I did. Um, you can find it at this website. Take a look at the presentation that I've done before. Take a look at my dissertation. Um, if you want to see that I've written, you know, I mean, they know you've written your dissertation, but if they want to actually read it, it's available. Um, if other people want to use your dissertation or use papers you've written and cite them, 
Um, citations are kind of like money in the academic world. The more citations you have, the more respected of an academic you are sometimes. It's not, an, it's not a great um, correlation, but it is looked at. Um, so it's definitely something that is worthwhile looking into. If you're publishing something or if you're doing a presentation, hosting it online so that it's findable and other academics can use it is a really big positive. Um, so definitely something to consider. And if you want to see what other people's look like to get an idea, if you want to see what dissertations in your field, other dissertations that have been um, completed at the University of Missouri look like. You can get an idea for formatting. You can get an idea of maybe what that whole process contains. Um, if you've never done a poster presentation before and you want to see what a poster presentation would look like, you can look and find it here. Um, author is useful if you're trying to find yourself or a friend, but a lot of times I think subject is a really important one or thesis department. Again, if you're doing thesis, thesis department's a good one as well. Um, and it kind of will let you know what exists in many different departments. Um, you'll notice agriculture has a whole bunch of different ones set up. But it's worth looking into, especially if you're considering doing publications or presentations yourself. It's a way to market yourself. OK, the other most space that I didn't really talk about, like I said, there's the institutional repository, and then there's a digital collection. And I'm just going to talk about that really quickly. Um, it is. The digital library, these are things that we have in our physical collection that we have digitized to make them available. So if there's something that a specific professor wants to be um, online for distance learning students, or if there is a material we have that's really rare, but we don't want to be the only ones that can ever use it, we want other people to be able to see it and use it as well, it's often digitized. Um, so there is a digital library. It's really neat um, if you're looking for older materials, it has a lot of those in it. Um, and the University of Missouri does have a lot of really neat, I keep saying the word neat, but I don't know a better way to describe it, um, collections. So the State Historical Society has things like the original diaries and journals that were kept by Lewis and Clark when they were on their expeditions. Um, the State Historical Society has oral collections as well. Um, and Special Collections has all sorts of things dating back to clay tablets. Do you remember the date? on that? I don't know, but it was really it was on BC. I mean, it's I old. think it's something like 3000 BC. Yeah. It's incre they're incredibly old materials. They're very um, rare. And so we try to share them with the rest of the world as well. So that's what most space is. It's both a repository and a library. The repository side is stuff that's published here. The um, digital library is stuff that was published somewhere else but that we happen to have and we want to make available to everyone else. OK. So heading back to the home page and back to Rachel. Okay. So next, I remember I was talking about the importance of partnerships that we have with other institutions. <laughs> the way that plays out for you is basically interlibrary loan. Well, there's Mobius. That's a kind of a partnership with the library. Libraries, academic libraries in the state of Missouri, MO, if for those of you new to Missouri, MO is the state abbreviation, Columbia MO. So you can think of Mobius as being um, state of Missouri, um, practically every academic library. So that's the first level of partnership. But then if you go out from there, we also have relationships with libraries really all over the globe. And if, if there's a book that you need, or an article, really an article that you need anywhere, or what? Or a movie. Or a movie, yeah. I mean, increasingly, I mean, it used to be when people, when libraries first started getting movies, like they would not lend them. And that's still true for some libraries, but it's starting to open up a little bit to where you can get DVDs sent over to you from other places. But um, yeah, if you need pretty much anything, you will, one way or the other, either through the da databases and find it at MU, you'll either get directed in here, or if you know already that something is not held locally, if you're looking for a specific article that we don't have, you can also go kind of straight over to this request an item ILL at MU. And there, there's a forum you have to log into it, and I'll log in brief, briefly to kind of show you what this looks like. Yeah. 
And here's an example. Remember I said I got something the same day? This is kind of the proof that that actually happened. Uh, this is from, I guess it, I, I did this request, yeah, it was yesterday. And and this, this is kind of what it looks like when something arrives. I, I got an email, and in the email there was a link, and I followed the link, and it took me here. And then I hit this View button, and I was able to open up this PDF of this article that I ordered. Now, and then I've also got a, a menu over here for different kinds of things I can do here. New request is what you're going to use most often. So articles, and then book or DVD, CD, and then a separate one for thesis or dis dissertation. This is when you're going beyond Mobius. This is, or really any article or a book, DVD, dissertation beyond Mobius. Okay, so that's what you use them for. The, the form looks a bit like this. Often, if you're coming in from the Find It at MU system, much of this will be filled out for you, which is nice. And even if you don't, um, somewhere in there, the, the information about you has been filled in automatically because you logged in. The, the fields of stars are required. Okay, so I'm, I'm showing this to you, though. Actually, I'm going to look at the one for book DVD to show you something in particular. There's um, in this notes field, it's, it can be really important to, to fill that in during certain circumstances. For example, if you are interested in using the wonderful resources of the Center for Research Libraries, which everybody should know about, it's, um, it's called CRL, Center for Research Libraries. It's in Chicago. It's one of the best interlibrary loan partners that we have, and they will loan crazy stuff. I mean, one time an undergraduate student was writing a paper about comparing the 1979 Iranian revolution there with the Arab Spring in whatever it was, 2012. And they wanted, they wanted a newspaper. And CRL, the Center for Research Libraries, actually sent the paper newspaper from Iran. OK, it had been published in Iran in 1979. It was in English, well, conveniently, for the student who didn't you know, speak anything but English. And, and, and so the student could do the project looking at that physical newspaper. Like, nobody does that. Only CRL does that. It's wonderful. And if you want to know the kinds of things that CRL has, Center for Research Libraries, and you can probably look on our website under CRL or Center for Research Libraries and, and get something like this. But um, they have they have many digital things. If you are doing anything, if you're there's a few areas that you that you'll really want to use CRL for that they have real strengths in. One of them is newspapers from all over the world, also ethnic newspapers. So like there's a, a class this semester that's doing black liberation movement, and they're almost certainly going to be in here using some of these newspapers. And they will send you the microfilm. Remember, we talked about microfilm roles. They will send you those. But for a certain, if you're a researcher at MU, you can even request them to actually digitize whatever you know, part of the newspaper that you need. And they will send you an email. And from then on, that digitized portion will be available not only for you, but for everybody else that uses it. So these newspapers, it's good for. Also, if you are interested in foreign dissertations, non-US dissertations, they have tens of thousands of these things. So those are kind of two areas that they're really good partners for. And yeah. No, you pay nothing. We, we, the library pays tens of thousands of dollars a year to be a member of CRL, but this is a benefit that you get as a member. And I mean, I, I think they'll only do a couple of thousand dollars worth of, of digitization per person. But every one of you in this room could get $2,000 worth of like digitizing of materials. And, and that's all fine because we're a member and we get those things. So it's for, for you, you pay nothing. Um, so how we can log in and uh, <coughs> borrow things from your borrow books or articles? Good you? question. How to borrow from them? Well, some of the things you will see have been like when I when I say that the newspaper, like if you're looking for the St. Louis Post Dispatch, if you want 1904, that's been digitized and and you go 
you search their catalog, or I like to browse the catalog to, to be able to see a little bit more kind of what they have. You look in newspapers, you know, select, you, you sort of dig down to the newspaper you want, and you'll see that some dates are available online. And from there, you just go in there. You don't have to, let's see, if you, if at some point you're, if you're off campus, they may ask you at some point while you're in here to log in, and then you would use your paw print, your MU credentials. Um, but if you're on campus, you won't even see that. Um, and if you are not there, let's see, and, and if the newspaper issue that you want or the dissertation that you want is not digitized already to where you can just click into it, then what you do is you go back to this ILL at MU request, and that's where it's important to put in the notes field and, and, and in the where, maybe to put, put in the where you learned about the, the item. Somewhere in here, you might want to say CRL or Center for Research Libraries or something. That might, yeah, I mean, the, usually our interlibrary loan staff knows to kind of look if, if stuff requested is in CRL, but it might make it a little bit faster to say, okay, I know it's in here, and, and they know that they have such good loan terms. Like, there were graduate students who needed a whole bunch of issues from Women's Wear Daily, which is a newspaper. I mean, it's a daily in, in the fashion industry. And, and they sent, you know, huge amounts of it. Like, other libraries, they'll send, like, a little bit of it for you to use. But CRL sends large, huge amounts. So to be encouraged, just if you find something in there and you need it sent, then you go to that interlibrary loan book request. And they even have, as part of the membership benefit, if you're not certain, if you think maybe they have something, but you're not sure, or you're having trouble with their website or anything like that, there's even a reference, a research librarian over there at CRL, whose name is Mary, and Mary will help you. <laughs> and let's see, what's the easiest way to, they, they've over, I'm sorry, they've, they've, they've changed their website a little bit, but I guess, yeah, CRL Connect, yeah, now that's something else again, but CRL members, we are all CRL members here, yeah, that, I don't know, you might have to dig around a little bit, but, or maybe at the bottom there's somewhere about how to contact, but know that there is, you can either contact your subject librarian if you need help with anything CRL, or if you dig around their site long enough, you will doubtless find the contact information for, for them, and, and they have a dedicated reference person available to, to help over there. So uh, they are one of our, and they're, they're physically located in Chicago. And if you're ever in Chicago, they will know, if you're a member institution member and you tell them ahead of time, you can go visit there and use their stuff right there. But they will also send it here. That's the beauty of it. So, okay. Oh yeah, and Hathi Trust is another cool thing is, hey, raise your hand if you've heard of Google Books books.google.com, ring the bell. Yeah, it's, it's a neat thing, but Hathi Trust, I'm here to tell you, is even cooler. Um, Hathi Trust does a lot of what Google Books does, but it does it a little bit more carefully, <laughs> I guess I could say. It's, um, you can search the full text of books that have been, they have a relationship with Google Books, and they've, um, They've got it so that you can do a full text search. You can look, if you're looking for a needle in a haystack, you know, if you want to find some book that mentions some very particular person or some very particular historical event or something, you can look through the full text of books. And it doesn't mean that you will get to read the entire full text of that book online if the book is really old or if, for some, or if it's maybe a federal government document and it's out of copyright, you might be able to read it online. But even if you can't read the whole book online, you can at least know that on page 236 of such and such book, there's information about, you know, the, your term comes up and is mentioned. And then you can proceed to look that book up and see if we have it locally, or you can, um, in the case of the full view book, you can look at it right there. They're, they're another partner that we have. Um, and they have a mobile website as well. You can, as because we are members, you can also even create a little collection of books if you want to sort of cross-search the full text of just those books. So you can do that. I mean, you can that requires you to log in again with your paw print. But 
but a lot of what you can do with Hathi Trust is available to anyone. There's under their collections, some of them are, you know, the collections you've made yourself. You can create a new collection. Then they have their featured collection on different topics. And like if you want to look through Islamic manuscripts, you can look through a set of ones that, that somebody has put together like that. It's ones, you know, it's things that scholars have put together that they think is, is useful as a group. So, okay, I think that about covers that. And only one person teaches, so uh, just to that, and so that one of you all, I will mention the undergraduate research contest back on library.missouri.edu. If you actually probably if you just put contest in here, that's all you have to really remember. Undergraduate research paper contest. It's got a rubric. If you ever have to teach a class and you want to have them do an assignment, to have the students do an assignment that has to do with um, doing research. This prize actually has a rubric on it for kind of yeah, under the rules somewhere. It's It's got a real nice, the scoring rubric is actually a really good rubric for just creating research assignments in general. So it's kind of a hidden gem there. Kind of the, the papers that we look for to do well in this is are ones that, that have good, that show good use of research. So good, just a good thing to know about. So. That's a little bit of what's up with library and Kim will round it up with ways to find out to kind of stay in touch and with whatever's happening here. Okay, there, like I said, we click on a lot of things. Um, there are a lot of links that we did not get to today that I highly recommend looking at on your own at some point. There's services for, there's a specific section for graduate students. Um, and undergraduate students, there's information for those of you doing research, for those of you doing instruction. Um, it's broken down that way. If you are online, there are a number of links that are very helpful for distance learners. Troubleshooting, if you ever have trouble accessing materials, how to have books shipped directly to your door. Um, so they're really worthwhile looking into. So services four is a good drop down <laughs> list to look at. I also want to point out this picture banner that scrolls. Um, new as of a couple weeks ago, this went live. It's a blog for the library that is hopefully going to help keep um, everyone up to date on what's happening at our library. So when we have new databases, when we have new articles, we got a new librarian just this last week, so that was exciting. Um, workshops that are coming up. That one, the picture didn't load, which is sad. Um, but you can find out information. It is all labeled, so if you're interested in knowing what workshops are going to happen, and find it out that way. Um, if you're interested in people and finding out more about the librarians, about different events and exhibits, all of that can be found through this blog. Um, I think it's pretty neat. These pages used to just go to text-heavy pages. They're prettier now. They have pictures. Um, so it's a good way to find out more about the library. Um, we also do have social media. So if you are interested in Facebook and Twitter, or if you want to get this blog as a newsletter, rather than going and checking the blog, you want to get a monthly newsletter with like the most important things for graduate students, or the most important things for distance learners. Those things can be sent to you as a monthly newsletter. So there are a lot of different ways that you can sign up to keep in touch with the library. Um, I did want to point out really quickly, under class resources, there are a number of workshops that are taught here. You're at the Fridays at the Library workshop session. We have um, these every Friday. They're at 1 o'clock, both online and in person. But if you ever can't make it, <coughs> or if a session went really fast and you can't remember how to get to things, they're all recorded. Um, it is all recorded. The online sessions are turned into videos that are hosted on YouTube and can be watched. So we have videos and tutorials. Um, any of our workshop recordings, including today's, can be found online from this semester, from past semesters. Um, so any workshop we've ever done, you can find the videos of. Again, if you are interested, say, for example, in citation management tools, EndNote or Zotero, and you want more information on that, and the class session went really fast because it's a lot to cover, you can go back and watch the workshop about it. We also have another uh, a number of events that are hosted in the library. Um, and again, sometimes they're not always conveniently dated and timed for you to come. 
Um, so last, the last two semesters, we've had a reoccurring event called Black Lives Matter, um, addressing things that have happened at Mizzou in the past few semesters. And it's usually a panel of researchers, faculty who study um, in the Black Studies Department, and they're presenting on their research, on their experiences. And it's a way to begin community involvement and engagement and conversations. Um, and those are recorded as well. So if you ever can't make one of these events and you want to find out more or you want to watch the actual recording, that's all available here online. There's a fair amount we didn't get to. Um, like I said, lots and lots of links. So the most important link we saved for last, it's that contact us link. Um, if you ever have any questions about something we talked about in this session, something we didn't cover that you still have questions on, um, or just any information that you would like to know, please feel free to ask us. You can, of course, come to the library and ask in person. But if that's not convenient, we have telephone number. Um, we do texting, emailing. And there is a chat box that, as of this year, is open 24-7. So you can chat with us at any point in time. So please feel free to use that. Like I mentioned at the beginning, the librarians might be the best resource we have, despite everything else I showed you. So, oh, yeah, absolutely. Sure, absolutely. Um, to find the recordings again, under the library homepage, there's this class resources. It's a drop down list. And there's a link for recordings and tutorials under there. Um, the other easy way to do it is, again, if you don't know where something's hidden under the page, just that top search bar, type in recordings, and it'll come up as your first result. Are there other questions? And I'm going to open up the chat box as well in case anyone online has questions. If, if you're really interested in following a subject current breaking news, mm -hmm. is there a way to set up, say, Brexit. Is there a way to set up every day? I yes. want to know what the news feed? and BBC and Manchester Guardian say, and that would come every day. I know that we have ways that you can set up feeds for databases. Um, I'm not sure about newspapers. Do you know, Rachel? I'm trying to think. I don't know. Factiva would probably, if it's from our databases, be the news database that you would use for that. And I'm not sure what they're, I'd have to look and see, because each database works a little bit differently. But I, I tell you, I, for, um, I know you can set up Google alerts, too, just through Google. And I don't know if there's a way to sort of narrow it to information, but you, you probably could. Because you can do any search on Google and set up an alert for it. Like if you do, if you go to Google Advanced Search, and you have it search through the URL for the Manchester Guardian and the URL for whatever other news sources, and and you add the, have the keyword Brexit in there, then then you can you can do that. You can execute the search, and once you get the search how you want it, I believe there's a way. I I know there are. Then you might have to Google Google alerts, and because I think it's, a, I want to say it at least used to be a third party thing that somebody figured out how to do that, and it may be that it was one of those things that Google bought at some point or that they sort of took over. But but I'm I'm pretty sure it's still a thing, and you can still do it. So Google alerts is the is the term. And that's going to be good for your free news kind of stuff. But you could the other thing to again, Factiva is our big news database now. We used to have LexisNexis. It's gone. We have Factiva. Yes, and the way so the page that I have showing now, I went to that databases by type we talked about earlier and clicked on newspapers. So these are the databases that are specifically newspaper articles. So these provide newspapers from around the world in multiple languages. It's not just English. Um, so Factiva is the one that Rachel mentioned, but most databases you can set up a request for them to send you an email anytime a new article appears. For things like Brexit, that might be a little bit overwhelming. Um, so you might want to try to set it up as a weekly thing. I'm not entirely sure how that works, but if you want, we can work together with you to figure it out. In one of our later sessions, I know we touch on database alerts too. And there's yeah. a page, like if you look up database, if you search page for database alerts, and then look for, the, the, there's there's a page that says how to do it in each of our main database families. And if there's, if there's a way to do those in Factiva, it should be listed. Um, yep, database alerts. 
Yeah, yeah, no, I know what you're talking about, but yeah, no, those days, there is such information Niagara Falls these days. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's really, the free, Google free, alert. Free, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, we are running out of time, and I did see a hand over here. So, what was your yeah, question? It's also, a related to the question about the database. So, I was just trying to find the database that where I could find journal articles about leadership, for example. Mm -hmm. How would I find that? So, literature would be a subject area. So back on the home page, did you say literature or leadership? Leadership. Leadership. I'm sorry, I misheard. Under looking for a database, um, there's databases by subject, and it really would kind of depend on the type of leadership you're interested. If it's business leadership and management, if you're looking at political leadership, um, educational leadership, I think that you would kind of go based on what type of leadership you were looking into. So management is one if you're looking at company leadership. Um, that, so I, there are a number of places that that could be located. I don't think we have a subject that's specifically just leadership. Um, but you would maybe go into management and then run a search for leadership. I'll if that makes sense. a few sense. places, you know, compare them and see where you get your most helpful mm -hmm. results. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. There is a suggest for purchase. Um, that is under the contact us link as well. So I'm sorry for the people online. I'm clicking links very quickly. But on the home page, there's that contact us. And there's a bunch of different links. And one of them is recommend a purchase. If you recommend a purchase, it will let us know, um, obviously, the title of what you're recommending. So we'll be able to decide what field it belongs to. And it also lets us know what department the request is coming from. So if you are a student in the Department of Education, the education librarian will be the one who gets that request. And they'll be like, OK, someone from my department is asking for this. So I'm going to use the money that's set aside for education to buy this material. So yes, absolutely. If there's something that you need um, and we don't have it, we can get it. We might also say if it's available in Mobius to go that way. Um, when we purchase materials, it does take a little time for it to be purchased, shipped, and processed. Um, if it's coming from, say, Columbia College across the street, it would be much faster to get it through Mobius. So it really depends on what it is that you're looking to use it for. But yes, and you in can the absolutely. cases of those local yeah. colleges, like if you find out through Mobius that a book is at Columbia College or Stevens College is the other really close one here in town, you have the right with your student ID to physically walk over to Columbia College or Stevens College and get a book. That may be the fastest total time way to get that book. It will use more of your time, and it's perfectly OK to, to use Mobius to get it. It'll take longer total time to get it that way, less of your time. So it's kind of, you know. You can walk over there. Yeah. yeah. Now, if it's in St. Louis, you probably don't want to do that. But if it's if it's Columbia College or Stevens, you you just present your MUID card, which is the same thing you use to check out books here, and, and you can do that. And that's true for those of you that are online and are distance learners. This is true for any Mobius partnered library. If you live in St. Louis, you can take your MUID card and go to WashU, go to SLU, UMSL, any library that you would want to visit, you can use your MU. ID card to check out materials from. Okay. And we, by SLU and UMSL, we mean St. Louis University yes, and the I'm University sorry. of Missouri St. Louis. I'm using acronyms. My first year here, I was.